Welcome everyone to today's session uh, co-sponsored by the MHTTC Network Coordinating Office and the E4 Center of Excellence on board behavioral health disparities in aging. Thank you for joining us. We're going to get started at the top of the hour. As people are joining, if you want to jump on the chat and let us know who you are and where you're from, I always love to see where folks are from and what your job is or what your role is, why you're interested in being here. We're excited today to talk about um, a difficult topic, but a really important topic, grief and loss, an active approach for older adults. Thanks again for being here. All right, way to go, Augusta. Heidi from Annapolis, Indianapolis. Thank you, Marilyn, New Hampshire, Nashville, West Virginia. Fairbanks, Alaska. Hey, Pelican Lake, Wisconsin. I'm here in Chatech, Wisconsin. Hey, Farmington, Missouri. Great to have everyone join us today. We'll get started in about two minutes. If you wanna peruse the, um, the screen here, talks a little bit about the difference between the Q&A and the, and the um, chat pod. So welcome, you are welcome to use the chat pod to um, make comments, you know, talk about what's going on um, in the presentation. If you have a specific question for our presenter, please put that in the Q&A pod. And um, we'll have a live Q&A session near the end, hopefully the last portion of the webinar. And we'll get to those questions then, Q&A, in the Q&A. Um, but if you have just comments or thoughts, if you wanna talk in the chat, I love having an active chat going on, people really getting into the topic and the, um, having a conversation there is a great kind of other channel for the work that we're doing today. We're excited to have our colleagues from the E4 Center joining our audience from the MHTTC network. Today's session is being recorded and we will be posting the session um, so you'll have access to it afterward and the slide deck and all the goodies from today, the recording and everything. Hey, Bronx, New York, Northern Colorado, Cheyenne, love to see everyone from all across the US states and territories. We often have folks joining from other countries as well. So thank you for being here. Our network, the MHTTC network and the E4 Center are both funded by SAMHSA. We're thankful for the funding to provide these free training and TA services for you. Want to definitely please check out both of our websites. We'll ask Felicia to drop the websites into the, into the chat so you can find us online and see what our next upcoming events are. Hello from Frankfurt and Ohio and Texas and Bowie, Bowie, Maryland. There's our websites in the chat. Welcome, welcome everyone. <clears throat> Welcome, Puerto Rico. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? I'm Heather Gotham. I'm the director of the MHTTC Network Coordinating Office out of Stanford University School of Medicine. And I am excited to be um, collaborating on this presentation today with our colleagues at the E4 Center of Excellence for Behavioral Health Disparities in Aging. So I'm gonna do a bit of an introduction and then send you on your way to our amazing speaker. Karen, if you could advance the slide, please. 
So we're gonna be hearing today about grief and loss and active approach for older adults. Next slide. A few housekeeping items. Um, we've made every attempt to make today's presentation secure, but if we need to end the presentation unexpectedly, we will follow up using the registration information. Typical of these, everyone's muted and can't share video. If you have a question for the presenter, please use the Q&A pod. But if you have a comment or link for attendees, then use the chat. We'll be getting to the Q&A uh, portion near the end. We'll have a live Q&A session with our speaker. At the end of today's training, we're gonna ask you to complete a really brief survey about the training. That information really helps us to plan events in the future. We love to hear your feedback, positive and negative. So please do fill out that survey. It's really, really quick. Um, and we will do a certificate of attendance. We don't have CE today, but we will do a certificate of attendance uh, for folks who join at least half the session, and we'll, you'll get an email um, about that using the email you use to register. We're closed captioned, and please find us on social media. Oh, I'm sorry, we do have CE for today. Oh, my goodness, we do have CE. Please excuse my comment about that. I'll have Aaron talk about the CE um, when we get there. Sorry for that. Yes, CE, yay. Next slide. Thanks, team. Okay, we are talking about a sensitive issue today, grief and um, grief and loss. Um, and so please be mindful if you need to take some uh, breaks for your own self-care, be mindful of that, be sensitive to your own reactions, breaks, stretch, drink lots of water, do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Here's some helplines and support um, if those are needed as well. Just a brief intro, if you don't know about us, the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network accelerates the adoption and implementation of mental health EDPs across the nation. So we're here to provide free training and technical assistance um, to help behavioral health providers up their game and provide more evidence-based practices. We're a little bit different than other SAMHSA-funded TA centers because we're regional. We have 10 regional centers, a National American Indian and Alaska Native Center, a National Hispanic and Latino Center, and the Network Coordinating Office, which is where we're from. Um, so please check us out on our website and you can find your center. So when you go to your when you go to our website, please look for your regional center. That's going to give you the information about local regional on the ground services, training and TA that are being provided in your area. So please find your center. Next slide. Just a disclaimer that this presentation was being is prepared for us under a cooperative agreement from SAMHSA. Um, the presentation will be recorded and posted on our website. We're excited to welcome Miriam Delphin Rittman as the new SAMHSA Assistant Secretary. We wanted to let you know that the opinions uh, herein are the views of our speakers and don't reflect the official position of DHHS or SAMHSA. Next. I am excited to introduce our presenter, Erin Emery Tiburcio. She's an associate professor of geriatric and rehabilitation psychology and geriatric medicine at Rush University Medical Center, co-director of the Rush Center for Excellence in Aging and um, with the Center of Excellence for Behavioral Health Disparities and Aging at Rush, our E4 Center. We're excited to have Erin with us and I'll let you take it away, Erin, thanks. Thank you so much. Such an honor to be here and partnering with the MHTTC today. Um, I am representing, representing E4, Engage, Educate, and Empower for Equity, the E4 Center for Behavioral Health Disparities in Aging. Our mission is to engage, empower, and educate healthcare providers and community-based organizations, as all of you are representing from around the country, uh, for equity in behavioral health for older adults and their families across the U.S. Um, those of you who have not yet had the opportunity to check out one of our events, we have um, a broad variety of different kinds of events that we host that are intended to increase the knowledge, skills, and attitudes of healthcare providers. Uh, we are building toolkits around building partnerships between community-based organizations and health systems to help older adults um, prevent uh, from, from falling through the cracks. We are promulgating evidence-based programs for older adult mental health and substance use and have a wide variety of resources for older adults and families that you all can access uh, on our E4 website. And 
Um, the, the E4 website is now in the chat. So um, let's dive right in to our topic for today, grief and loss, an active approach for older adults. So as we think about our lives, think about the pieces of our lives, the experiences, places you've been, where you've lived, family, friends, think of them as a tapestry intricately woven over the course of your life. And imagine that one of the threads is very long and has woven through almost the entirety of your life, the entirety of your tapestry. And now imagine pulling that thread out. And as you pull it, the tapestry gets ripped to shreds because each person can feel like that one string through that tapestry. And when we experience loss, it can feel like our lives just unravel, that the, the tapestry that is our lives begins to just come apart in pieces. So our challenge is to use our experiences and what we've gained from those we've loved to keep the tapestry together, even if a particular thread ends. So today we're going to be talking about some definitions um, that some you might be familiar with and some you might not be familiar with. And we're going to talk about the tasks of grieving, sort of a different approach than some of you may be used to. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what's considered normal grief to the degree that there is normalcy in it. And also what uh, how prolonged grief disorder is different or distinct from uh, normal grieving. And we'll talk about some treatment options for that. So getting started, um, a lot of folks use the terms bereavement, grief, and mourning interchangeably. But it turns out they actually mean something a little bit different. And it's important to understand that difference because bereavement, the base rate of bereavement is 100%. We will all lose someone. It's going to happen to every single person. How we react emotionally, though, to that loss is vastly different across humans. And it is the emotional response to bereavement. And so we all are going to have vastly different in emotional experiences, mourning then includes the social and cultural response to bereavement. And so if we think about that, and we think about the idea that um, cultural traditions may look very different and have some permissions or have some limitations around what's expected. So for example, um, in the Jewish tradition, and I will preface this, I am not Jewish. Um, and so if anybody wants to chat, chat in about my, my description of this, feel free. Um, but in the Jewish tradition, the family sits Shiva, which essentially means doing nothing but mourning for a week. People come by, pay their respects, offer support, bring food, all Jewish traditions involve bringing food. Um, but the idea is that all of the intense grieving is supposed to be completed during this time. The immediate family then has a year as, um, as, as a year as an official grieving period at the end of which the burial stone is placed. And the idea is to mark the end of grieving, time to move on. So all of that is wonderful permission and space to feel and experience. But what if you're not done in those time frames? So cultural norms would indicate that there's something wrong with you, right? And if you're not grieving intensely in that first week like you're supposed to, people might talk. So not only is the bereaved person grieving, but they have to deal with the judgments of other people around them about what's okay and what's not okay. And of course, this isn't limited to Jews. There are lots of different traditions in every culture. And so needing to be aware of those um, being aware of those traditions and how that can affect what people expect to be normal. So it turns out that in normal grief, it is very normal to feel stunned and shocked, even if the death was expected, even if somebody had been in hospice for months or years, that it's still normal to be shocked when it actually happens. It's normal to feel sad. It's normal to feel lonely, normal to feel like a part of yourself has died, that, that strip that has been pulled out of your tapestry. 
but it is also normal to be willing to reinvest in relationships and activities, that life remains meaningful, even if that individual is not there with you. And it's also normal to feel like you are still you and that you can still affect change and have meaning and purpose in your life. So you can feel like a piece of you is gone, but you're still you, all part of the normal grieving process. So it is also normal for symptoms of grief to, exper to be experienced within two to six months after the loss. And we'll talk uh, in, in a little while about why that six month window matters. I will say though, that sometimes it's much longer considered normal. So for example, um, an older adult couple who've been married for 50 years, it's pretty normal that that surviving spouse is going to be grieving for the rest of their life. It is also normal for a parent who loses a child to be grieving for the rest of their life. But not normal to have functional impairment for all of that time. So even though that spouse, even though that parent may be grieving for the rest of their lives, it is uh, normal for functioning to come back. Um, and that symptoms gradually diminish to normal functioning. So that idea that time heals all wounds, well, that's true for about 65% of us. So um, there's, there's a certain amount of truth to that, but we'll talk about what happens to those other 35% um, and what we need to do. So many of us, when someone is grieving, don't know what to say. So I'm gonna invite all of you in the chat box, what are some things that you say immediately after someone dies? What are some things that you have said, or maybe that someone had said to you that you found helpful, that you found um, meaningful, or even just, ah, that's nice. I, I like that language. I invite you to, to chat in some things that you sometimes say. I have no words. It's true. I'm here for you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, my thoughts are with you somebody who can only hug the person. So I think all of these, you know, sending you love, tell me about your loved one, my heart hurts for you, all of these are wonderful things to say. And the frame that I would encourage with all of that is that each person's experience is unique. I'm not seeing anything in the chat that tells somebody what to do or how to feel, right? Because it is most helpful to help that individual recognize they can feel whatever they feel. And some options, some additional options, there's some great options in the chat. Some additional options might be, I can only imagine what you're going through. And I don't ever say, I know exactly what you're going through. I lost my dad last December, and I would never say to another child, another adult child who lost their parent, I know exactly what you're going through, because I don't. I don't at all. My relationship with my dad is different than somebody else's relationship with their dad is different from somebody else's. And so I can only imagine what you're going through. One of the things I tend to say is I'm sending you all of the peace your heart can hold. Sometimes when we offer our condolences or we offer experiences, somebody might not be quite ready to take it. Like, I know you're going to feel better eventually. Right after a loss, most people are not ready to hear quite that but sending you all the peace your heart can hold, whatever you're ready for, or my heart is with you. There were a number of, um, a number of, of um, ideas like that in the chat as well. So keeping that frame. And I was also noticing some things that people do. What do you do after the loss? And um, offering food, there were a number of, of offering food, offering hugs, um, making cards. And all of those are, are wonderful offers of support. And again, that idea of each person's experience is unique, feel what you feel. So allowing people to have that space to feel, sometimes, um, as Luciana just said, just be there, sometimes saying nothing, sit in silence, hold somebody's hand, and potentially create a space to honor um, several years ago, actually, it was the first uh, the first intern that I uh, that I supervised as a 
as a faculty member, um, she called me on the way to her supervision time with me and said, I'm really sorry, I'm coming late. I just got a call on my way to the hospital that my grandfather died and I'm kind of falling apart right at the moment. So she came in and, and sat down and all I said to her was, tell me about your grandfather. And she talked for nearly 45 minutes, just telling me about him. That's all I said. And for years after that, on the anniversary of his death, she would contact me and say, I can't even thank you enough. I think about that hour as the most healing hour of my life. And I thought, oh my gosh, all I said was tell me about him. And that in and of itself can be powerful. Tell me about him. Or sometimes it, um, show me pictures, being able to um, share their experience of the person who's gone. So it doesn't have to be a lot. It can be silence. It can be tell me about it. It can be um, a hug. It doesn't have to be a lot. I think people feel a lot of pressure to do something. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. So in, after that, <clears throat> after that immediate part of the loss, my guess is the vast majority of you have heard of the stages of grieving, um, largely because this book has been uh, has been translated into almost as many languages as the Bible. Uh, there have been studies in colleges where if you ask um, college students, what are the stages of grief, they might not be able to get them in exactly the right order, but um, they can uh, name just about all of them. And it's kind of logical if you say, okay, um, you know, somebody's gone. And uh, actually, I should back up for just a second because the Kubler Ross's research was actually not about death. The book and her research was about what happens when somebody gets a terminal diagnosis. So if you're told you have stage four cancer, it makes sense that your first reaction would be, no, that can't possibly be, that, that can't be the situation. And so maybe you go get a second opinion and then maybe the second opinion confirms that yes, in fact, you do have stage four cancer. And so you get angry. How could this happen to me? Maybe I smoked or maybe I didn't smoke and I still have lung cancer. How could this be the case? And then, okay, God, if you let me survive this, I will be the best person. I will do all the things. I will volunteer at the soup kitchen, all the things. And then when it really sets in, oh, this is heavy, sadness. And then perhaps when you get to that point, there may be a place of, okay, this is what's actually happening in my life to me and to my family. And okay, this is, this is what is. And then perhaps hope, hope for a good death, hope for a legacy, hope for family to be okay. So one can imagine that somebody might move through somewhat in that linear fashion, even though as adults, most of us don't move through anything in sort of a linear fashion. And so after um, there was a, a, a great deal of sharing of her research, a number of grief researchers said, you know what, it's just not linear. We really can't expect that. And then interestingly, Majeski and colleagues in 2007 did a naturalistic study of people who were going through normal grieving, and they, um, they filtered out folks who actually had prolonged grief disorder, um, and folks who were experiencing normal grief, by and large, kind of moved through these phases. And so there's something to it. That said, if we think about stages of grief, that's a very passive perspective, right? So, and there's also all of that normalcy idea that, gosh, if I'm not moving from anger to bargaining and I haven't gotten there yet, or I haven't moved from bargaining to depression yet, maybe there's something wrong with me, or maybe I need to do something. So grief is such a profound loss of control that conceptualizing it as this passive thing that we just have to move through with time might not be all that helpful for some people. And so today, we're going to talk about another perspective. We're going to talk about an opportunity for tasks of grieving. So 
William Warden and Therese Rando, separate researchers, both were doing research on grief and identified what kinds of things that people do in order to successfully move through grieving. And they both came up with a set of tasks that in order to move through grief and feel healthy and healed on the other side, um, that there are a certain number of things that people need to do. And they both conceptualized them a little bit differently and chunked them a little bit differently. But I'm gonna present a combined model of those tasks today that I have found to be incredibly practical. And when I talk about tasks of grieving with my clients, I talk about them as being, you know, they're, they're things that we need to move through. And you may be able to work on all of them at once, usually accepting the reality of the loss comes first um, before you do the other things. But sometimes you're slapped in the face with relearning the world day one. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but this idea of tasks of grieving helps people feel like, okay, there's something I can do. There's something I can think about. So accepting the reality of the loss, again, often comes first. Um, but might be something that kind of evolves over time. So part of the task here is acknowledging this initial numbness and disbelief. And just like um, physical shock when, you know, you slice your arm open and um, by accident and, oh my gosh, I, you don't actually feel it. Well, there's a protective factor there from that initial pain. Um, that is that is part of that initial experience. Um, and very often we have that intellectual versus emotional experience, like, excuse me, I know in my head, I watched the casket go down into the ground. I know that they are gone, but in my heart, I just, I don't know how to accept that, that, that difference between knowing and feeling that forces us to confront ways that the deceased is no longer in our lives. And sometimes in this space, there's this obsessional review that I don't want to accept the loss. And so I'm going back over and over this endless film loop about what I could have done differently, or how did it happen, or what did the doctor say, or all of those things tend to happen very frequently in the first couple of months after somebody passes. It's also during this time that it's not unusual for people to see or hear the deceased. Sometimes it's in a full waking state, sometimes it's in dreams. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that here because it is not abnormal to have that experience. I don't have an interpretation for that. Lots of people have lots of ideas about what that is or what that means. But I point that out to say it's distinct from somebody hallucinating. Um, and so it can be really helpful to, to just talk about it. How did it feel? And the vast majority of people will say it felt comforting. It felt like they were saying goodbye or it felt like they were telling me it was going to be okay. But having an opportunity to just talk about that experience. So as people are working on addressing numbness and acceptance, critical that we attend to emotions and giving people permission to feel. So a friend of mine um, last spring lost his 11 year old daughter and he's not so good at emotions. So he threw himself into a new project and is now going great guns with this new project still a year later and has yet to actually allow himself to feel. He shed some tears right when she died, um, but since then hasn't allowed himself that permission. And that's what keeps us stuck. So as you're talking to someone who is grieving, encouraging that affect. I had a client once who sat in my office with a couple of tears just streaming down her face and it was all she could do to not cry. And she said, if I start crying, I won't stop. And I had to actually explain to her the physiology of tears that it's not physiologically possible for you to stop. And so, or for you to not stop rather. And so um, I was really encouraging her to feel and encouraging her to let that emotion out. And there are different ways that people let emotion out. 
um, but assuring that people are actually feeling those emotions. And one of the tools that can be very helpful is to invite someone to tell the story of the death. And this is something you as whomever, whatever role you play with that person need to be prepared for, because if you are still dealing with some of your own grief scars, you might not be quite ready for that. Assuring that you are ready to hear it. Inviting somebody to tell the story of what happened when they got the call that so-and-so was about to die, that they walked into the hotel or the hotel room, the hospital room. What did they smell? What did they hear? What was their physical sensation? Being able to walk through the sights, the sounds, the smells, the touch. The woman who, who I was just talking about who had difficulty letting go of her tears, um, she actually got to the hospital after her mother died. They called to tell her that her mother had died sort of unexpectedly in the hospital. And she got there and she was telling me about the antiseptic smell and the, the um, machines that were still hooked up to her mother because she had told them not to touch her until she got there. And that there were beeps in the hallway from somebody else's machines. And being able to walk through that experience, nobody else wants to hear that story. Nobody at a funeral is going to say, hey, tell me the story. What that does is it's much like the trauma response where somebody is just went through a trauma and you offer them that opportunity to tell the story of the trauma. It helps them to experience the emotion of that experience in a safe place and be able to begin to let some of that emotion go. There's a fair amount of research now demonstrating the, the traumatic element of, pro, of um, prolonged grief disorder. And this is a key piece of being able to prevent that from happening, of being able to tell that story, of being able to experience that in a safe place and being able to feel supported in that experience. So, um, being able to accept that reality that someone is actually gone is a key first step. And then doing one's duty to the deceased. So part of what can happen very early on is that survivor guilt. Oh my gosh, you know, I, and, and I hear this a lot in older couples, I was supposed to be the one that goes first. She wasn't supposed to go first. Why am I still alive? Or remembering only the positive or only the negative things about the person who's gone. Sometimes feeling guilty for even feeling happy after the death or laughter. Um, and sometimes feeling like you failed while they lived or failed at preventing the death. Sometimes there's this hindsight bias when I look back and I thought, oh my gosh, I should have been able to see. I should have been able to get them to the doctor. I should have, I should have, I should have. And sometimes that idealizing and devaluing of someone can um, be a significant difficulty. So part of this doing one's duty is to encourage a balanced view of the deceased. So sometimes, you know, we've all heard that, you know, don't speak ill of the dead. Um, well, it's really important that we encourage this balanced view. Like, yeah, you know, he was an incredible human, but oh my gosh, that, that toilet paper roll, the socks on the floor, just acknowledging that, you know what, there might be a few things I don't miss. There might be a lot of things I do miss and challenging people's ideas about the rules of length of suffering, like I should suffer X amount of time, whatever that rule is, either I should suffer or I shouldn't suffer. Um, and being able to examine the reality of some of these would have, could have, should haves. Oh my gosh, I should have gotten him to the doctor sooner. I should have done this. I, I, I should have taken better care of him. I should have, I would have, I could have, I should have. Well, is that true? Many folks who don't go to the doctor because of X, Y, or Z would be just about impossible to force unless gunpoint um, to be able to get someone to the doctor. So being able to really examine that reality and being able to, to even consider writing a letter to the deceased, what would you say to them? Often in, in session, I will say to someone, if so-and-so was here right now, what would you say? And what do you think they would say back to you? How might you want to honor who they are? How might you want to uh, be able to 
continue their work. This is how foundations get started. This is how trees get planted. This is how um, I have a a uh, longtime client who lost her son in a boating accident. And after he died, she worked with the Coast Guard to create a boating safety pamphlet that is now mandatory uh, distribution for uh, licenses for boats. And so doing some of that prevention awareness kinds of work. So control is a big factor in loss, right? nothing cert more certain than death and taxes. Well, this idea of control is a really difficult one. This idea that we have to confront our own helplessness. There's nothing I can do to bring them back, or there's nothing I can do to change their choices. And somehow now the choices I do have seem trivial. And so how do I go about having anything be meaningful? So as we think about how to help people create meaningful choices. Again, a piece of this is acknowledging the emotions, feeling that helplessness, acknowledging, yes, you know what, turns out that's a reality. There are so many things in this world that we cannot control. The one thing we can control is our own choices. And we can make our own behavioral choices and get creative in those as we move forward in a life without the deceased. So taking a look at um, what those options are. I was working with a young woman who lost her father while she was pregnant. And she was devastated because he was the most amazing parent. And he was, you know, she said, you know, he taught me how to drive. He taught me how to build things. He taught me all these things. And I don't know how to parent without him. If he's not here to help me as a grandparent, how am I ever going to be a parent? Well, so we looked at, gosh, you know, he was a really good parent. What did he teach you? What gifts did he give you that you can give to your child? And she was able to think about, she said, well, you know, my gosh, he's not going to be here to tell the stories. He's told me his stories a hundred times. And I said, well, could you tell them? And it actually turned out that she was an artist. So she decided to make a book of her father's stories while they were still fresh in her head and illustrate the book so that her children would be able to share in those stories and that she could share the gifts of her father's amazing parenting. So I will often ask people, so what gifts did they give you that you still have? And I, by that, I don't mean tangible stuff. I mean, what did they teach you? What values did they impart that are important part of who you are and how you live your life? And how can you, when you're missing that person, tap into that gift? Because the big challenge here is shifting your relationship with the deceased so that they're never leaving. They are a part of you. They are a part of that tapestry. You couldn't remove them if you tried. So how can you tap into that experience and consider what lessons you learned from them? So as you find that sense of purpose is kind of the next piece of it then to think about what our, what might our purpose be now and this is particularly a challenge for uh, family caregivers for somebody who you know I've been caring for my husband for 20 years and now he's gone now what do I do now what and and you know also asking the question well why did he die we try to make sense of so many things that don't make sense. And we try to answer all these questions that don't have answers. If we continue to ask the question, why did he die? Are we going to get an answer? So Janoff Bullman's assumptive world theory is that we are hardwired to impose order on even apparently random events. So we try to make sense of everything, even if it doesn't make sense. And that may include even our own continued living. Why am I even living? So as we think about trying to make that meaning, part of our job in that world, in that space, is to be able to notice questions that don't have answers. So if I keep asking, why did he die? 
Well, I mean, biologically, I could probably answer the question, but that's not the why that I'm really asking. What happens if we shift from why did he die to why did he live? I asked my client who lost her son, do you regret having had your son? With all this pain that you're experiencing, do you regret having had him? No, not ever. Okay, well, why is that? What was important about his life? We can answer that question. Why did he live? What did he give to me? What did he give to the world? What did he give to the community? Those gifts are the ones that we focus on. And shifting from why didn't I die? I should have been the one who died. Shifting from that to why am I alive? What am I still doing here? Or what could I be doing here? So we're shifting into the lack of meaning, shifting from the lack of meaning into creating meaning. Why am I alive? Well, turns out I have the opportunity to find that for myself. So there are lots of creative opportunities in that space. And as we do that, we shift from a life that is a right because we get angry. He should have been, he should have lived. He should, you know, there's, there's no reason why he should have died. And shifting from that idea of life as a right to life as a gift. And if I'm being, this, being given this gift for some undetermined time, I mean, my gosh, during COVID, how many of us had to face loss? right? That w- was not expected. Well, so now those who, those of us who have survived, we have a gift. And what do we want to do with it? Well, sometimes as we think about those gifts and what do we want to do with it? Well, I don't really know how to do that without my loved one. I have to completely relearn the world. And part of that work Um, I was working with a woman whose husband was in the hospital and he'd been in the hospital for some time and they had been preparing her for his death and she knew that he was going to die. Um, But hadn't, they had had a very, she and her husband had a very traditional relationship where uh, she did the cooking and the socialization and he managed all of the um, finances and she, uh, and, and where the trash went. She said, I don't even know where the trash goes. He's gone now. So she, she was supposed to show up for an appointment and she was late for her appointment. And it was unusual for us to have a morning appointment. Usually it was in the afternoon. So she came in and she said, well, he died. And I, you know, I'm, uh, yes, I'm hurting, but I, uh, the most difficult thing for me right now is that I was late because I don't even know how to set the alarm clock. And I'm realizing I don't know how to set the alarm clock. I don't know where the trash goes. I don't know how to balance our checkbook. We were so traditional in our relationship that I have to learn how to live in this world practically without him. And so for some, it's a very practical experience. And for some, it's a little more relational. Some don't even want to relearn the world. No, no, no. I want the world to go back as it was with him in it. I had a patient for a while who essentially spent weeks just going through old photo albums because he was in those photo albums and she dove herself into the world of the past. So trying to figure out how to go forward in a world that he was not in is not something she was interested in doing. And this relearning the world was an enormous challenge to to figure out how to change her relationship with her husband. So um, we figure out how to embrace a new life perspective and how to engage in new relationships and how to recognize that, yeah, this piece of me is gone, but, and, not but, and, this piece of me is gone and, I can engage in new relationships. I can try new things and figuring out what can I count on and figuring out how can I stay in the present moment. And sometimes as we're relearning the world, as we're engaging in new activities, as we are trying new things and going along just fine, sometimes um, people end up with this enormous upsurge of grief. Part of my first job um, out of graduate school was in palliative care. We started up a new palliative care service in the hospital that I worked at in New York. 
And my job, part of my job was to call family members about a month after the death. And as I would call, um, I, uh, one of the, the gentlemen that I called, he said, oh my gosh, how did you know to call today? I was just in the grocery store yesterday and I was going along doing just fine. And there I am standing in the pickle aisle and I burst into tears, uncontrollable sobbing, missing my mother. I have no idea what triggered this, but out of nowhere comes this grief. Am I back at step one? And we talked a little bit about what that felt like and how normal it actually is to sometimes have those triggers. And for some, it's a sight or a smell. Anybody who's ever walked through the first floor of Macy's and gone, oh yeah, I dated that guy in seventh grade or, oh my gosh, that was my kindergarten teacher. Incredibly powerful reminders that sometimes we don't even notice. Or sometimes it's the first anniversary of, or the first holiday with. Father's Day was pretty challenging for me this year, my first Father's Day without my dad. And sometimes it's those very obvious things that create them. And sometimes it's standing in the pickle aisle. But recognizing that, yeah, that can happen and they will likely decrease over time. It's okay. You're still moving forward. So acknowledging that ambivalence about moving forward, I don't really want to move forward. I want to go back. But here we are. And so how can you learn new things? How can you reconnect with some of the things that maybe you didn't do before? And how can you reconnect with other things that were maybe just you? Maybe you used to paint and getting back to that or you know, other building new relationships and laughter. Yeah, it's okay to laugh. It's okay to experience life going forward. And a few moments on what happens when people don't. And I'm going to move very quickly through this because I just wanted to point out that sometimes grieving goes beyond normal grief, that grief as itself is a very normal experience. And so when people started doing research on the what ha on the disordered grief, there was some concern about over pathologizing grief. It turns out that's unwarranted. When people who are actually experiencing severe symptoms get a diagnosis, it's actually quite relieving that, oh gosh, okay, there's something that's treatable. So now prolonged grief disorder has had enough research that it's included in both the ICD and the DSM. You will get a copy of these slides that will have all of this information on it because the next part I'm gonna go through very quickly. So you'll have all this information in your hands. Prolonged grief disorder um, was about six months and um, death of a loved one more than, than 12 in the DSM. And we'll talk a little bit about that, that time piece. Um, but persistent longing and yearning and preoccupation and um, having difficulty engaging with others, feeling life is, is meaningless, intense loneliness. I wanna illustrate this with Mike. And no, that's not actually a picture of Mike. Um, so Mike was a gentleman who came to see me, and actually I'll, I'll go back one so you can keep these in mind. Mike was a gentleman who came to see me after his wife died of breast cancer. And when she died, that was the first time he had ever lived by himself because Mike and his wife uh, moved from their parents' homes into their home together. And she was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer very close to the end of her life. And when Mike came to see me, he wasn't functioning at work. He was a trader and had lost his business hundreds of thousands of dollars. He found himself crying in the bathroom half the day at work. He was not social with their friends that they had been. He had four kids and the kids were desperate to have him get some kind of treatment. Um, and he would very often thought, thought that he saw her out of the corner of his eye. He would still set a place for her at the table and none of her clothing, none of her belongings were removed from the house. He was not able to accept her death. And for Mike, he couldn't function. And so I want to point out this critical difference in people who are not able to function after months, it is time to get treatment. And there are effective treatments for folks like Mike, because if folks don't get treatment, it turns out that prolonged grief disorder, people who have those symptoms at six months, 
predicts problems at 13 months. So people who are more likely to start smoking have altered sleep problems, altered eating problems, hospitalization. And two years later, if they're still not treated, increased risk of cancer, cardiac problems, alcohol, and suicide. So we need to take it very seriously if people are not functioning as a result of their grief. So attend to those symptoms and um, you'll have in the slides these risk factors. I'm not going to go through them in the moment. You can take a look at these on your own because I want to point out that there are a number of different kinds of treatments for grief. For many people, being prepared for grief, being ha having the opportunity to say goodbye, the opportunity to say, I'm sorry, I love you, I forgive you, please forgive me, can be incredibly powerful. And being able to say goodbye, it turns out really matters because even for caregivers of individuals with dementia who were prepared for the death, two and a half times less likely to have prolonged grief disorder. Those who do have prolonged grief disorder, um, there are some really effective treatments. Complicated grief therapy, whoops, um, initially created by Catherine Shear and her colleagues, has been incredibly um, effective. It is an adaptation of cognitive behavioral therapy that um, addresses the trauma of grief and that the idea that people will avoid the trauma. So there is an exposure component. And for those who are able to tolerate the treatment and tolerate the exposure, incredibly helpful. For some, that exposure is a little too powerful. So they might benefit from a more mindfulness-based intervention of coming into the present moment. And mindfulness interventions have been incredibly powerful at decreasing rumination, which is a lot of where people get stuck in grief. Awareness of thoughts, awareness of the present moment, as opposed to staying really stuck and connected to the past. And now also particularly relevant during uh, COVID and as telehealth grows, the opportunity for internet-based interventions that um, utilize cognitive and behavioral strategies that uh, really focus on behavioral activation and getting out and being able to engage in life. And some people say, well, gosh, can't I just take a pill? Well, it turns out that after multiple randomized controlled trials looking at bereavement-related depression, the meds actually do help symptoms of depression and anxiety, but not a single one of those trials impacted actual grief. Grief is a human experience. It is an interpersonal experience that requires an interpersonal intervention. So whatever layer of grief somebody is experiencing, Maintaining those things that we tell everybody, getting consistent sleep, exercise at least once a week as supported by research, ideally a heck of a lot more than that, stable active routines. Um, and so as we're able to eat well, move more, sleep better, those three things can treat almost anything, quite frankly, um, but particularly important as people move through grief. And those of you who are interested in learning more about this would recommend taking a look at William Warden's Grief Counseling and Grief Therapy book, and also um, the Complicated Grief Treatment and Manuals at the Center for Complicated Grief. They've got some wonderful resources to learn more. So as you attend to the tapestry of your life and the tapestry of lives around you, helping people to recognize what is that thread and how is that one, like I think about my grandmother in, in my tapestry in my head, my grandmother's the silver um, thread. And I very regularly identify that silver thread in my own life and my own behavior. My grandmother lived out loud. And every time I find myself living out loud, I say, ah, hi, Graham, thanks. And we have that opportunity to do that. So I'm gonna stop there. And um, as we uh, dive into questions, just gonna very quickly mention, we've got a couple of wonderful upcoming workshops through E4, our ongoing reframing aging webinar series. And for those who are interested in learning more about cognitive behavioral therapy with older adults, uh, Ann Stefan and Dolores Gallagher Thompson, who are phenomenal teachers, will be teaching culturally responsive cognitive behavioral therapy with older adults. So I'm going to um, stop there and um, Heather invite you to um, moderate some questions.
Thanks so much for a great presentation, Erin. We have a number of awesome questions. I know we won't get to all of them, but one of them is about um, uh, working with an older adult widow who was married for 65 years and at the last three months while his wife was dying, he wasn't as supportive and present as he should have been because he was in denial. And now he's feeling a lot of regret, um, enormous regret founded on his lack of action and behaviors that he knows in his mind and heart he should have taken. How can we help those with legitimate regrets and the overwhelming pain of that, including the pain of the loss of their loved one? So thank you for that question. And it is so common to have, yes, very real regrets. And at the same time, I think I would encourage him to give himself a little bit of grace because when any of us is experiencing that level of intensity of pain, being present in it is excruciating and sometimes not even possible. And so the idea that he might have done the best that he could in that moment is likely. So he can would have, could have, should have himself into a hole, which is might be exactly what he's done. And to be able to say, okay, so let's say you didn't make choices that looking back, you wish you would have made. Well, what choices can you make now, given that you can't change that experience? If you felt like you were not able to honor her while she was alive in those last moments, how can you honor her now? So the idea that he's somebody who's kind of stuck in the past and stuck in these would have, could have, should have passed elements, help him come into the present. And what can he do now to honor her? What can he do now to help other people honor her? and to maybe engage, um, the, engage her uh, in his life a little differently. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple questions also about um, when grief is disenfranchised. Um, so um, working with an older adult woman who just lost her father, um, and it sounds like the father sexually abused the, the client's sister, but not her. And so the family has experienced very differently this person who's lost now, who's, um, who's died, and, and people are experiencing grief differently. Um, and, and the client is feeling that their grief is disenfranchised mm. in the family system. Yeah, so it is incredibly difficult when the life or the loss is experienced differently in different people. And I think, so, so a couple of thoughts come to mind. One is to, um, for her to identify people she can talk with just about her own experience and own her own experience. And her experience is going to be different from somebody else's and to be able to say, okay, what you feel is what you feel. It's not wrong. What they feel is what they feel. And that's not wrong either. So recognizing that even though you're in the same family, you may not be able to share that same grief um, and identifying people who you can share that experience with um, that will acknowledge that what you feel is yours and owning that what you feel is yours. Um, I think that the idea that there has to be some kind of consensus in the family doesn't sound very realistic. Um, and that getting angry at somebody else for how they feel is also probably not so helpful. So encouraging everybody to feel their own experience of grief and perhaps the family needs to grieve separately um, and grieve with others who may, ex who may be able to identify or understand that experience. Thank you. Another question, many older folks I work with are grieving physical losses, possibly as well as grieving losses of loved ones. Any recommendations for applying those tasks of grief to this population of people grieving physical losses? It's a great question. And I actually give a very similar talk for our occupational therapy school at Rush, talking a lot about those physical losses. 
And yeah, being able to acknowledge that, you know, losing functionality, um, you know, I, I can't walk independently anymore. I have to walk with a walker now. Being able to experience the emotions that go along with that, being able to experience what is life like now? What meaningful choices can I make even though I've got a walker? How might I be able to decorate my walker and celebrate the fact that this is my new, um, my new accessory? And so being able to relearn the world, moving through the world with my new level of ability, um, absolutely. Um, so just kind of thinking about each one of those tasks through a physical lens um, absolutely can be applied. Here's a question about providers. Uh, many providers are misinformed about grief or have not done their own grief work, and this contributes to dysfunctional grief processing and creates barriers to healthy grief. How does one tactfully ask a mental health provider if they've done their own grief work? I'm not sure if there is a tactful way to answer that question apart from flat out. I think um, one opportunity is to be able to say, hey, you know, you, um, I, I just went to this really great presentation on grief here, this might be helpful for you. Um, and also in the, the um, this is actually reminding me that in the follow-up email that you all get um, will come uh, the handout that I give to clients with the tasks that are sort of written in um, easy to access language that you might say, hey, here are some things for you to think about, or here are some resources that might be really helpful for you to learn about. I've discovered that this is helpful for my clients. Um, and I'm, I've also discovered that when I haven't, you know, before I had this education or before I did my own grief work, so kind of speaking from your own experience, before I did my own grief work, I was recognizing I might've been harming people. And I, you know, might encourage you to just think about that. So it's tough when you recognize your colleagues might not be prepared to do the work that they're doing, um, but offering resources is one option. And I think perhaps a last question, um, a few, there were a few questions about stages of grief and um, are stages of grief still upheld by modern psychology? Kind of what's the current? And I know you, you talked about that a little bit, but I think people are wanting a little bit more on how should we think about the, those Kubler-Ross stages given what we know now? I think they can be useful as a way of thinking about, you know, people will move forward and all of those things are natural things to experience. It is natural to feel sad. It is natural to bargain. Um, it's natural to, to, to get to acceptance and hope. Um, and so it can be very helpful. Um, again, I think my perspective is that that sort of passive idea isn't necessarily as helpful as a more active approach. Um, I am aware that, have not read, but I'm aware that Kubler-Ross's co-author has written a more active version of the stages of grief. Um, so that might be of interest to, to some folks. I don't know that there's actually consensus on the stages of grief in the grief research community, um, as much as there is this idea that each person's process is going to look different and um, accepting that. Uh, and so an awareness that these might be things people move through normally. I think for, from my perspective, the bigger thing for health professionals to be aware of is when it's no longer normal and being aware of those, those symptoms of, of um, prolonged grief disorder so that, that you can connect that person to effective treatment. Thanks. I wanted to um, also let folks know that on our MHTTC website, we held a, a grief sensitivity virtual learning institute back in September and November and had Dr. Shear uh, present on um, the, the CBT model for prolonged, um, for prolonged grief. So there's uh, more resources available on our website. I know we've had a, a, some discussion in the chat uh, related to the evaluation and the continuing education and just wanted to remind everyone that we are going to be sending out an email if you're having difficulty with um, uh, the CE, claiming CE or with uh, taking the what we call the GIPRA survey, the evaluation, we are going to send out additional information. So um, please wait for that email if you're having difficulty right now. We'll make sure that we get you all the information. Um, thanks so much, Erin. Any, any last comments? 
would just invite folks to be both patient with themselves and with others as they grieve and invite people to have their own emotional experience, yours and theirs. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, you'll be receiving an email within a week. We'll have um, posting the recording of this and um, the slide deck will get you more information about planning CE and completing the valuation. Um, Aaron, excellent presentation. Lots of lots of kudos in the chat for you and for the work of the E4 Center. And thanks for being great colleagues. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with you. Thank you so much for this joint presentation and for hosting. And we're uh, really excited to continue to partner. Thank you. Excellent. Take care, everyone.